And speaking of the Spider Mitchell trade, you know, it, it, as far as an update, still a little bit of the same stalemate between both sides. You know, staring contest between Ainge and and uh, and and Leon Rose and um, Fred Katz of the Athletic joined Mark Stein, NBA Insider, on Spotify, and they had a bit of a conversation on the situation. And uh, you know, it wasn't too much groundbreaking stuff that came out of it. A lot of the stuff we covered here on this show, but. I think one of the key factors is going to be the framework around the picks. And so let me play this soundbite here uh, between these two guys in, in, terms of what, of, in terms of what they're thinking was uh, about this concept. So to everybody in the chat, once again, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. Let me get to the clip here. 27 and give up for Mitchell is enough where, where there's enough left over to where I can make a move for a star in 2024. Uh, to me, that would mean not wanting to trade that 2027 and that 2029 first rounder. I would be doing pretty much whatever I could to keep those because come 2024, if you're two years down the line, that's gonna open up another first round pick. And that means you're gonna be able to trade 27, 29, and your 31 first rounders. Uh, uh, Jalen Brunson could be an expiring contract that year. He's got a player option the following year, but he could be viewed as expiring. And if he is, that means he's on a team-friendly deal. That could potentially be the last year of Julius Randle's contract. He's in the same position as, as Brunson with a player option to follow. You can piece together salaries. You can throw together those three first-rounders, and you can make a legitimate offer for a second star at that point. And at that point, R.J. Barrett's only 24. Donovan Mitchell is only 27. Like, that's a young core right there, and, and, and now you're cooking with gas. But I, I wonder if Utah would do that. I mean, you know, you, Utah's going to want that 29 pick. It's going to want that 27 pick. And, uh, you know, if it doesn't have it, then my guess is they'll be saying, fine, well, then R.J. Barrett's in the deal. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know how that might necessarily come together, but if I were the Knicks, I would not be doing a deal that that, that – hurt my ability to go get a star in 2024 or 2025 because ultimately they'll need to add more even if they make a good Mitchell deal. And that was Fred Katz on the Mark Stein Spotify Green Room session that they had last week. And this is important because, you know, just last week we had the debate on who of the non-RJ players would you trade of the Grimes, the Quicklies, the Obies. And I think it's an important one because the Knicks are going to have to sell Utah on these guys plus a, low, a lesser pick package, right? Because as Fred said, which I agree with, you don't necessarily want to part with 2027 and 2029. Now, these are the Knicks' own picks. Yes, they mm -hmm. do have the conditional picks, but those aren't going to be worth so too much. I mean, Fred, I think based on what Fred was saying was that the highest, the lowest in terms of draft slot that these picks will con could convey to, could convey to is number nine. That, that's, the, that's the lowest pick or the highest pick, whatever you want to consider. It. That's the best you can do if they convey, if they convert. It's not a guarantee that they do go uh, that, that high. So those conditional picks aren't worth as much. So now you're looking at 2023, you have your own, you have the Dallas pick. You have your own in 2025. Remember, you can't trade back-to-back -back picks. That's the Stepien rule. Can't trade back-to-backs. So you're looking at odd years, and you can only go seven years into the future. So you're looking at trying to sell Ainge on... Your two 2023s, your 2025, that's three picks. Now it gets tricky. Yeah, I could offer him a couple conditionals. Is he interested in that? And if not, do I need to put two of the three of a Grimes quickly OB in that package to make it worth his while? Ooh, that's where you start to lose me. When you start, when I start thinking, having to give up, you know, whether it's quickly Grimes or quickly and Toppin or Grimes and Top, it's a lot, man. You need, you need 
depth. You need rotational players. At minimum, we've seen these guys be rotational players. We just saw what happened to the Brooklyn Nets when you don't have quality role players to go into the playoffs. They got swept by the Boston Celtics, all right? Boston Celtics are a good team where you look at, all right, we have our top guys, and we got solid depth. Even if they lose somebody, somebody can step up and next man up type of system. Brooklyn didn't have that. We've seen it before. We look at the Lakers. They don't have that. When you lose LeBron James, you're relying on, and you lose Anthony Davis, who you're relying on. So if you do that for the Knicks, and it's a team of Jalen Brunson, Donovan Mitchell, R.J. Barrett, Julius Randle, and Mitch as your starting five, and you got nobody else coming off the bench that's quality, yeah, your starting five is solid. But once they come off the court, are you keeping the lead? Are you just allowing the other team to go take over? And then you're sending your first unit back out there to go try and win again? That's just, you don't need to do that. And that's where it's like, this is why it's not, at an all cost deal. If someone yeah. else wants to pony up that type of deal, by all means, go get it. Go, go do it. I'm fine with seeing what we have and being patient and waiting for the next star. We've seen time after time after time again that a star becomes available. We've seen it. Whether it's Kawhi, whether it's Paul George, whether it's Russell Westbrook, James Harden, Ben Simmons, all, all these guys. Hey, the All way they, they the way they've been throwing a CAA party around. Is, hey, maybe it's Embiid, <laughs> maybe it's Booker. You know, you never know. You never know. So losing two, I'm all fine with the picks, especially if you can give up. You know the the picks that you talked about, and they can give up most of those conditional picks. And that's why it was like when you saw the Knicks make that those deals. Like, sure, it helped open up roster space and it created cap flexibility to go get Jalen Brunson. But you, when you look at the return and you're now starting to see that, okay, now you have a star that wants to be here that is obviously doing everything possible to say, I want to be in New York. I mean, the man's at my childhood middle school <laughs> at one of the basketball camps giving yeah. a speech. Yeah. Right? Because he's from that area. He's from the 914. Shout out. Yeah. Like, he wants to be here. But yet you, the Knicks, it's so it's difficult because you're like, all right, they're, they need picks and they need the youth. I'm going to get the picks and I'm like, if you can add all those four protected picks plus three of our, plus the three that you, you mentioned CP, that's great. Go do it. Yeah. But that that's that was the case, it would have happened. Tricky. Yeah. That, that's how this thing gets real tricky, bro. Fast. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because if, if you're going to put, like, if you're even going to put 27 in there, it pushes up. It, it delays your ability to go after somebody else with an enticing trade package. It's a tricky situation. Unless you believe that you've got some star potential in an OB, in a quick, in a Grimes, where you say, okay, I can afford to give away this unprotected future because I feel like these guys can help me now and into the future.